Hello and welcome to Build Series Sydney. I am your host, Danny Clayton, and I have a sensational guest today. He's a master of all trades. He is a comedian, an actor, a writer, a director, and also the star of the latest comedy drama, Upright. Let's have a very short teaser. Please make him feel welcome. The poetic pianist, Tim Minchin. Thank very much. Hello, how are you doing? Good, thanks, Danny. How are you? I'm very, very good. Good. Excited. So much to talk about. I mean, straight away, off the bat, upright, it seems like, you know, a small love story to Australia. Uh, shot across some very beautiful yet arid and, and brutal lo locations around Australia. Uh, tell me, what was it like shooting across the Nullarbor? Uh, it's good. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I love Outback Australia. There's something despite, I think most Australians, despite the fact that we're almost all of us coastal creatures, have this um, slight obsession with our backyard with outback and and a, a connection depending on how much you've done it with the, the the red dirt and all those uh cliches and definitely for me having done a lot of camping as a kid and driving across the Nullarbor with my folks and um I drove across the Nullarbor just after Sarah and I got married when we left Perth as it turned out forever um we did the drive and they are some of the most visceral and happiest memories of my life. And so writing this story, all, all of us who wrote it, Chris Taylor and Leon Ford and Kate Mulvaney and I have our own experiences with that and we're trying to mm. pour that into the show. Um, when you shoot, of course, you can't really shoot. I mean, you send a, a second unit out to get drone shots of the bite and, and long shots of the car out in the Nullarbor, but you can't actually shoot on the Nullarbor because you can't afford to take – electricity and water and mm. you know a hundred crew and you just can't do it so you shoot we we shot most of it in south australia um and yet even though we weren't actually on the nullarbor you still you're still properly out in the middle of nowhere and uh shooting outside places like woomera and corn and uh it, it it is beautiful and you do these long long days where it's all cameras and shots and angles and lighting and frustration and all the stuff that comes with filming and then you sort of wrap and someone brings out a bunch of muffins and some coffee and you just sit <laughs> and you just go oh shit look where we are mm. you sort of have this moment and then sun goes down and you're just in yeah. starville yeah i mean there were some parts which were quite beautiful without even trying to be beautiful. Like, for example, there's a, a tree covered in, in thongs that have been nailed against it. There, yeah. were, there were blowflies, an army of blowflies and like a, a, back, a pub in just in the middle of nowhere. And, and it's kind of the stuff that makes me feel like I'm at home. Uh, why do you think the, these imagery, which might not be so glamorous, still has such a strong hold on Australians? I think there's a cynical and a uncynical answer to that. I think we buy into our national identity in a kind of bullshit way, you know, oh yeah, we're Aussies and we're all Larrikins <laughs> and we, you know, we like thongs in the outback and pubs and you're like, you're a hipster from Newtown, bro. You, <laughs> you've, you, have you ever been out there? Yeah. Have you ever met the people out there? You know, mm. that's the cynical answer. The uncynical one is to the extent that national identity means anything, it means a connection with the sights and smells and atmosphere of your home. And this notion, this indigenous notion of country, which us white fellas can't access because we mm. haven't been wandering around here for 60,000 years, whatever, the, I still, the, we, when I talk to indigenous people about country, I, 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 I get this real, for someone that's lived all around and did leave my home, you know, 13 years ago and haven't lived back there, I have a, I have a sense of country mm. that belongs in Western Australia that has a particular smell of acacias and eucalypts and a particular smell of salt water off the Fremantle Doctor wind and, you know, these things. And I, I think they're real. Mm. And if you've travelled into the interior a bit, you never forget 
the feeling of isolation and of you know the f- flora being minimal and the and the horizons being infinite and the stars being like nowhere on earth and uh and i and it sits inside you and it, and it, and it it's real you know i kind of hate nationalism but i love my country it's yeah. somewhere in the middle there there's the truth yeah and, and one of the most profound compliments i can give you about this show without even addressing is how the, hot this, i look in the mood how good you look yeah, yeah you look okay. fantastic yeah. uh, it surprises me yeah. um <laughs> every morning <laughs> in the mirror yeah oh tim hell of a <laughs> shock i'm you yeah. <laughs> awesome um, no, pushing aside the the characters and the storyline, one of the the things which stands out the most for this show for me is it. It's, you can feel it, you can smell it, you can feel like the heat. I'm just watching the show, even when you're inside in a beautiful air conditioned room, uh, and I think it's very powerful. But this is a story, and this is a, a show that came to life while you were still in LA. Uh, so tell me how you managed to capture you know so much of Australia while still living in another country? And when did it all start uh, for, for you? Well, I think um, that's a, a question with various pathways. Mm. I mean, when you're writing scripts and, and generating stories, sitting in a room with Kate and Leon and me and Chris and, and Nikki, our script producer, Beck, um, you, you are conjuring um, s- story out of personal experience, out of just your knowledge of how to tell stories, which we've all accumulated from different places. Part of my understanding is four years trying to make a Hollywood animated film that, you know, uh, in a studio run by a guy who came up on the, on the Disney playbook, you know, so I had all that experience and, and you're, you're trying to bring story craft to it and then to bring your personal experience of your country to it. Um, and I think capturing Australia, I, I think uh, one of the things I'm proud of is what you're talking about. And capturing Australia means a whole bunch of stuff. And again, they're cynical and uncynical. I mean, we have a snake and a baby Joey and we have these interactions with um, some of the outback animals that are the cliches of our country, but they are subversive always and non-exploit we're not it's not crocodile dundee Mm. we also have interactions with aussie types and yet i i'm proud of the fact that it it, we're not exploiting the aussie cliche of like oh one thing about australia is we're all charmingly naive you know (laughs) we we were all a bit like limited but in a nice way from the mouths of babes comes you know Mm. it's not it's not it's not bogan aussie humor Mm. um and and by the way, that cultural sort of meme we have that came out of all those working dog films and Kath and Kim, and I mean, it's amazing comedy, but it's not, that would be fraudulent for mm. me and Chris Taylor and Leon and Kate to do that because that's not our, we're not working class Aussies. We're all, you know, went to uni for too long and mm. um, got, you know, <laughs> wanked over philosophy and stuff. And so I'm trying to, trying to bring uh, a, a version of Australia that is authentic, but not built on the cliches of our, of Mick Dundee and beyond. Of course. Um, but the other incredibly important part of capturing Australia, the, you said the visceral sense of the heat and the space and the flies is all about Katie Millwright, is about the DOP. And I don't know what mm. witchcraft she understands that I don't understand, but I, she's a beautiful photographer. Mm. And, and even to the, the ratio of the shot, we decided to shoot it wide, like more like a cinema ratio to try and get and all those long shots and the kind of flatness and mm. and the whole journey moves from right to left, from east to west, like the car's always traveling in one direction, all those tricks that help you tell the story of distance and space. I didn't notice that at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you, I mean, in most road movies, you choose a direction, a screen sure. direction. If, you, if, you're, if you're traveling somewhere, mm. mostly on the wides, with, you can break the rules whenever you like, but mostly on the wides, mm. you're always, yeah. the, the audience... It's like, well, well, are they going back? You, you you don't understand how much you 
you do all that maths in your mm -hmm. head as a viewer. Yeah. So the, the ute's basically going right to left. Sure. And on the ute, just, just a really quick question. <laughs> um, was that a bucket head, uh, Mr. Hemorrhage from the Rick and Morty TV shows on the front? I don't know. Or is it a Ned Kelly reference? It's a Ned Kelly reference okay. and it was Matt Savile, the director's idea. Mm. And he went to the art director and went, I reckon he should have like a Ned Kelly doll. Mm. And uh, it's such a beautiful thing because then when we got to Ep 5, um, that doll comes to signify something, mm. a, a memory no or something. Yeah. Okay. And so you, so you, and, and that is what I love in telly and in storytelling. And what I, I think upright is soaked in mm. is if you watch all eight episodes and then go back and start again, you'll see a whole lot of clues because the whole thing's a mystery. Mm. Who are these people? Why? Mm. Why? Why is yep. this guy trying to cross the country with a piano? Why is that kid out there? Yep. And we trust the audience will just stick with us because the characters are cool. Sure. And you think, how are they going to get along? Yeah. We don't give the audience much information about their mission, about their want in the Disney mm. terms, which is unconventional, sure. not unheard of, but quite unconventional. And you don't actually find out everything you need to know until the final episode. Sure. And that is what Upright is. It's a road movie and a journey of discovery and a journey into the dark heart of their soul and, you know, sure. blah, blah, blah. Can we character. talk about Lucky for a second? Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, no, hold on. I'll pull you up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Lucky, he seems to be, uh, when we initially meet him, he's like the, from our first glance, he's like this washed up cocktail pianist, you know, he's yeah. a band guy. And, you know, where he's we're conflicted. Do we know if we should like him? He it, very early on, he is set to make a huge betrayal, and we don't know how we feel about him. But you know, when we look at you as a, a person, you're someone who has you know graced the stages, playing piano and performing in front of people. How much of you know Lucky uh, is is from you, and and where else the other parts? Where else did you find Lucky? Well, you know, Chris Taylor, this is his idea. The seed of all this is Chris's, and Leon and Kate were on board before I came on board, so. Um, when I got the pitch document, it was like this, you know, 40-ish guy who's kind of not made it and he's uh, – I, I can't quite remember what his story was but um, it didn't have an ending. It didn't really have a reason. It, it, we didn't know much about him when I got the document. And so when I came on board and, and said, yeah, I, I want to do it but I want to write um, and everyone went, oh, okay, um, I brought – a whole lot of stuff to him and I think what I brought to him is firstly I exploited my Perth upbringing my family my relationship with my brother playing music in pubs um I brought all that detail did you want to get Dan to play your brother like did your actual brother to play your brother in the show at um, any point uh I d Dan, Dan used to act a bit, um, but I don't think he's up to it. Um, uh, and I'm not wow. sure. I'm not Hi sure. Foxtel, I'm not sure Foxtel and Sky would have uh, put the put their dollars down on old Minch. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously, when you get these things, that the the people paying for it want you to populate it with actors of profile and of repute. Um, but Dan is in it, oh. uh, and you have already seen him. Uh, he in a flashback right back to the '80s. He plays Lucky's dad. You're kidding. Very, very brief. You only see him very briefly and you hear him yelling at Toby. Yep. Um, yeah, so I flew him to Adelaide. I always try and get Dan, you know, I get him up on stage every now and then. He played with me at the Sydney Opera House a few years ago. Um, he's a beautiful, beautiful guy. And and he and I played together for years until Sarah and I crossed mm. the Nullarbor and left. We always played together and I never really found another Dan. I never found a replacement for him. Um, but he and I are best mates and... And we didn't stop playing together for any reason, except he was never really going to mm. do it. He, he was always had a proper career um, and I was always going to take the gamble. Um, but I, I took that relationship and went and sort of when we were trying to figure out why is Lucky in the desert with a piano, we were trying to build the story around it. I uh, collabor collaboratively, but um, drawing from my own past sort of thought, what would it be like to mm. to be in exile from a family as close as mine? That you know, I'm so close to my family, and I'm so close to Perth. I love Perth. I, it, but but if you go, okay, but what if I broke that? And then suddenly you have this massive mm. emotional, hypothetical emotional mine mm. to mine. Yeah. And 
uh, yeah, so I, I brought all that and all my old gigs and and because I was 30 before anyone sort of started listening to me. So I've done a lot of gigs in pubs, a lot of cover bands and weddings and I've had moments of thinking I need to quit and do something else. And so I, I brought all that kind of what if I hadn't got my lucky break and it went the other way, mm. I, all those what ifs, all good stories are what ifs. That's sure. Um, something else that you did mention very briefly and I wasn't sure if it was appropriate for me to talk about in case I was rubbing salt in the wound. Oh, yes. But something I was incredibly excited to see was uh, a project that was called Larrikin, which is was turned to Bilby, which yeah. was a, a completely Australian animation. Yeah, it was going to be. Starring uh, you know, Hugh Jackman, Naomi Watts, I believe. Yeah. Um, Jackie Weaver, Margot Robbie, Ben Mendelsohn. Uh, incredible. Uh, yeah. And, you know, about a Bilby. And the yeah. only vision I saw was of a Bilby being chased by a Goanna in the desert. Yeah, yeah. Um, super thrilled. But this is a project which got shelved. Um, yeah. it, it, do you think there is any hope for uh, this project to see the light of day, considering it seems like it's pretty far along? Yeah, it was three quarters done. Um, and it would it would have been the biggest, you know, apart from Baz Luhrmann's Australia, it would have been the biggest Australian film ever. I mean, it was a proper singing animal, $100 million film um and there was we spent five years on it and um it was beautiful character design um by a french guy called pierre perafel and um and well he didn't design but a head of animation and incredible landscapes and you talk about the visceral feeling of australia it's one thing to capture it but to generate it out of zeros and ones to mm. to have meeting after meeting about no that, that's not the right color red that's that, that that's not australian dirt keep keep working on that or you know they a um, bunch of bunch of european animators uh, and designers trying to draw eucalypts and i'm like no that eucalypt leaves hang down they don't stick out like come on um and so all this like just incredibly granular and it was beautiful. Uh, the characters were beautiful. It was it was sort of rough and tumble, and it was a musical. So the songs were well. I had Briggs and Sam Simmons wow. playing rapping koalas, uh, commentating like a football game. Mm. Look at that! What a mark! It's a pretty good jump from a standing start. Reckon he'll kick that little burrowing bundle out of the park. Like like Whoa. proper hip hop yeah. Aussie. Like it's like a chase that turns into a football game. Bobby and it, wants it's, you it's, to sing some songs yeah. right now. What do you think, everybody? It's a, it's a, I wish I had them. <laughs> I wish I had them. I can't. I, 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 they just, they're super secure. Mm. Oh, I probably could leak them. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, the, that song, the chorus of that song was like a scar. Yeah. I'm an animal and I go balls to the wall. There's always fights to be fought. There's no time for whining at all. It's proper, like, Aussie influence. Sounds like a jam. It was super cool. And they just didn't. Okay. When Universal bought DreamWorks, they they bought DreamWorks because mm. they're going to reboot Shrek and they're yeah. going to reboot because yeah. all Universal does is buy franchises and thrash them until they're dead. Oh, gosh. That's, that's what they do. Hi, Universal. <laughs> um, honestly, fucking psychos. Um, yeah. I'd like to thank our sponsors yeah. today, uh, Universal. Uh, so, I mean, like, in short. Uh, oh, they they do, used do, it yeah, as yeah. a tax write-off. I mean, I... I and the trouble is if someone new, you know, took over the studio. In fact, I know the lady who's now the head of the studio and I, I quite like her. If she rang me tomorrow and went, we're going to pull it out of the bin, um, that will be quite difficult because I've, I've made, up, I've made, I've made upright. I've, I've taken all my anger and love and stuck it into upright and it would be a bit, uh, uh, it would be quite traumatic. Because it's also a fucking punish. <laughs> like animated films are hard. Yeah. But you know, it, Harry Cripps, who wrote the original script, is a beautiful man. He spent eight years on the thing. Wow. And for him, I would go back. Oof. But what I would love to do is if it came out of the bin, put someone else on it, I'd be an executive producer, keep an eye on it. I can't go back to full time. Okay. That would be the wrong move. That is very, very heartbreaking. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's move on to something a little bit more positive. Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, something that I've Cancer. seen. Cancer. Uh, <laughs> I've got this tumour. Yeah. Um, <laughs> something of yours, which was prolific across the internet, something that spread like wildfire was uh, your speech at the University of Western Australia. Mm -hmm. um, it was a heartwarming speech. It was very deep and it was basically you giving, you know, rules to life or tips, advice. Mm -hmm. uh, when you made that speech, did you ever anticipate that it would blow up the way that it did? 
No. So what well, was it? 2013, I yeah. think. And it was the day after my birthday, I think, or before. And so you I were f- hung over when you did <laughs> it as well. Amazing. Well, I flew in and my, my folks talking about country have a, um, they grow sandalwood trees in a little property in York. And, uh, and, and the Perth airport's kind of halfway between where we grew up, the ocean and York. So often I turn right instead of left out of the airport. So I go, I'll spend the first night up at the farm. And um, I went to the farm and dad was there by himself. Mum wasn't there. And dad and I just, I just spent two days up there and I was writing this speech and dad read it and went, I wish you wouldn't swear. And so I took the swear words out and, um, but that was it, like day and a half. Just slammed it down. I thought, oh, God, it's pretty pretentious as a 38-year-old or whatever I was, um, like giving life lessons. But at the same time, when you're graduating uni and some hairy guy that you've seen off the telly comes and he's 38, that that's 20 years mm. of experience. And my job, I thought, if I'm going to do it, I'll do the wear sunscreen version of it. Like if I'm going to do <laughs> it, if I'm going to wear a floppy hat, I'll go high status and just give advice. And um in fact, it's a hard hat, floppy gown. Mm. Um, Which you took off before yeah, you made so the speech. Yeah, I know. My hair was so to, dirty you and they to get shot your hair out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think it, it's the, the most viewed thing I've created in my life, mm. apart from maybe episodes of Californication. <laughs> and, and like someone put it on, on a gold cast, which is like an inspirational American website. I think it's been viewed 70 million times on gold, yep. which they, yeah, which they, a round of applause. I don't think that's a round of applause. I, they, they like cut it up and put like inspirational pictures over it. Didn't ask permission. I mean, oh dear. Fuck knows how much money they've made off that video. Yeah. I don't really care. Bring them up. I, I love, yeah. <laughs> Can I just send me a bottle of wine, you pricks? Um, uh, I, I love that it got out there and I often think, what would I have said if I knew it was going to be? Well, that was my next question. Yeah. I mean, if, I, how would you update it? I, well, I don't think I would need to. I, I, I have thought about like writing a little a penguin or someone said, can we publish that speech? And I said, give me a minute. I'd like to use that speech as bouncing off points for, because actually the, the, the speech, like a lot of what I do in my pretentious way, it, all those rules, are uh, funny versions mm. of things that have a lot of crap underneath them. So they're, you know, the stuff about, you know, well done you for pulling yourself up by your own shoelaces, but they're, you know, they're not even your shoes. Like the, the, that is all based on me reading about free will and determinism and there's, there's, there's shit underneath it. Mm. And I, I, I sometimes think I'll, I'll do a little wanky book, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I haven't, my worldview hasn't altered. I mean, I'm a materialist. I, I believe there's no inherent meaning in the universe and that, and this is back to upright conveniently that, and, and, and the, the beginning of upright lucky, and this is not spoilery because it happens very early. You know, the first conversation Meg and lucky have is Meg going, I can't believe we just had a car crash. Like if I hadn't have been there in that moment, you know, like that's something, this must've happened for a reason. Mm. And he tells the story uh, of, of one of the members of ELO who got killed. Elope, yeah. Elope, uh, of the, the ELO, uh, uh, who in real life, um, Mike Edwards got killed just driving along and one of those big hay bales rolled down and crushed his car. Like just two things, two, the, he explains that the odds on that happening are not too mm. infinitesimal. And, and, and the whole show is, is built on this bedrock of an understanding that, um, life is uh, chaos and nothing happens for a reason. Mm. And like my speech and like everything I've ever made really, including Groundhog Day in a profound way is about how you find meaning in a meaningless universe and, and about the fact that the only way we can live as human beings is to create good narratives in the face of the, the profound emptiness of, of living Wow. And, and so that, that's what, that's not, nothing's changed and I and never will. I will never think that the universe has a fucking plan for there. There's nothing more solipsistic than someone who thinks the universe has a plan for them. It's just that most people don't get past that. Wow. That's a lot to consume. Um, no, it's fine. Everyone. I mean, it's, it's, it's true though. Yeah. You know, you, you, you generate meaning. Basically. Um, I did want to quote someone. Uh, his name's Richard Glover. And he said that oh, you, like Glover. you are what you eat, but you are also what you read, what you listen to, what you see, what you consume. Uh, don't 
uh, eat too much junk food for your yeah. brain. Oh, great. Uh, so for you, I mean, I, I consider you to be like a salad uh, for the brain, really. Oh, thanks. Uh, tofu salad. Boring salads. and wet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, well, with a really spicy oh, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. dressing. So, uh, yeah. so I wanted to know what your brain is eating. Like, what do you consume uh, for your brain? I, 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 I profoundly agree with Glover. And I, and I, I'm not a snob by a long shot and I'm not, I don't, I, I mean, I, I consume shit <laughs> both, um, foodularly and in, in all metaphorical ways. Uh, n not literally. I don't, I don't eat. <laughs> That's where you draw the line. Yeah. I don't eat actual shit. I, oh. I mean, yeah, it depends how hungry I am, but, um, <laughs> uh, cat poo coffee. Uh, you haven't even tried uh, that. Oh, yeah. It's great. Yeah. Um, I, I do think, I do think our obsession, our postmodern ironic obsession with popular culture, like, you know, watching Love Island or whatever with an ironic, I just think just, just don't, I, I, I just don't fucking watch it. Just don't watch it <laughs> like that. Just don't ever fucking watch that shit. Just like watch something good. Uh, but I do understand how addictive it is and that those are stories. I, I just, I just wonder, and the, and the one I feel most passionately about is just never read a story about a celebrity. That's okay. just shit. That is the uh, bottom of human interaction. Uh, uh, what's that person doing? They're pretty. Uh, Fucking don't, <laughs> don't read about celebrities. It's just, just shit for your mind. Right. You has, know? has there been a story which has been kind of pushed into your face recently that has made you think this way? No, I just like, I just think it's just the, it's just the bottom of human endeavor, like <laughs> magazines built on photos of women who look too fat. I mean, just fuck mm. off. I, yeah. I hate it. <laughs> I hate it, and so that that's snobbery. But yeah. but you know, I, I'll I'll read a Lee a Lee Child for every nonfiction book mm. I read. I, I I I love stories, and I'm I'm a philistine in nearly every direction. Mm. Um, but I do think part of finding meaning in a meaningless universe is um, c consuming stories and information that on a without any intent, mm. without any intention to use the info. I, I think there's a fundamentally reasonably something good salad like about just um, trying to consume knowledge and not just stories mm. designed to make you feel angry or sad. Yeah. But don't you think that's changing? I mean, you've got like the rise of people like the rock star physicist, Brian Cox. I mean, and he is bringing, you know, intellectual profound ideas but yeah. to a commercially you know, c consumers. Yeah. So do you think that the Cox is hot? I, I, <laughs> and, but, but you know, he's, he's uh, Carl Sagan in the uh, Cox is modeling himself completely on Sagan and Sagan was huge in the seventies. There's always been an audience for that stuff. Mm. We nerds, uh, Brian, I, you know, Brian, what he does now, I started with him. We, we, the very first time Brian got on stage, I was there. Um, we were doing Uncaged Monkeys tour with nerds with, with, with Ben Goldacre and Adam Rutherford and me and Robin Ince and Cox. And Cox used to play piano on a version of White Wine in the Sun at the end of the show. Anyway, Kidding. love him. Um, we slightly, the trouble is we're always preaching to the converted, right? The, the nerds who turn up to see Brian are already uh, managing their cosmic vertigo on a daily basis, thinking about time and space. Mm. How, how do you, I mean, it all trickles. It must trickle. Mm. And what you want to be doing is always creating content for some young kid looking around going, oh, this Jesus thing I was taught doesn't seem right. Where do I, oh, there's a funny song. Oh, there's a handsome guy talking about space. You just need to make sure there's always a rung to grab onto for people whose interest is peaked. Mm. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, we have been getting a lot of questions oh, coming shit. in yeah. through people who are how, watching. How long? I'm sorry. Okay, I'll start shortening my answers. Uh, that's I'm okay. Not going to start uh, shortening my yeah, just one word answers. Yeah, sure. Uh, Miles. My favourite colour yeah. is smeg. Look, we, we spoke about this. You're, you're <laughs> churning through our time here. Uh, you're smack. Uh, given you're a writer, actor, musician and many more amazing titles, what advice would you give uh, for any artist with a love for their craft coming through the ranks today? Um, I, it's, I don't think there's any great advice. I mean, everything I said in my speech is kind of wraps it up. Unfortunately, there's an element of, uh, no, not just an element, a huge amount of luck 
and not luck as in, oh, one day a uh, record label exec will walk into your gig and go, oh, you're luck as in you create work and there's an audience and you might intercept for a while and then you might, you know, part or you might be lucky like me and have weird fans who stick with me, whatever I do. Um, so you have to accept that you are making an offer. Your art is always an offer and people can accept your offer, hopefully with an open mind, or they might not like it. Uh, that's not under your control. What's under your control is, um, is integrity and application basically mm. in a boring kind of way, like try and be the best version of the thing you do, try and consume a lot of ideas in the world so that they can be filtered down into your own work mm. and don't think too far ahead. Don't think one day I'm going to be a star because that's just nothing to do with it. Is it interesting for you to see some of your work that has had an effect far ahead. I mean, you brought out that incredible uh, song about canvas bags at supermarkets yeah. in what, 2005? Yeah, yeah. And now we've banned the, the plastic bag yeah, in like 2018. That. Yeah. So that, that was you, yeah. all um, you. Uh, yeah, uh, that was a song taking the piss out of uh, people who think that songs can change the world. That's the beautiful irony that that song eats itself. Um, it, it is. It is amazing and something I have to reflect on and not take for granted because I'm always thinking about the next thing. Um, Matilda being the main thing, mm. the, the longevity of that show and the impact it has. So I don't know, maybe a million kids have seen that show mm. and for three quarters of a million, it might have been their first big show mm. and the first show they saw has a little – super feminist six-year-old singing about rebellion and and uh intelligent rebellion about how important and how books are you can emancipate yourself through ideas that 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 stories are your gateway to freedom all that i i, I am deeply proud's not quite the word grateful mm. that i wrote this thing yeah. that gets to it it it, it, it Influence it's, the future. Yeah, in, it's in it's amazing. Way. And it's so nice for me, given I've said some pretty fucking dumb shit, that that I, I am probably going to be remembered for Matilda, which is okay. nice. Um, in one sentence, yes. uh, I mean, because Roald Dahl died five years before you were even born. Yeah. Uh, what do you think he would have said? That's not quite right. Did you really? Definitely? No, he died in 89 or something, so I was a teenager. Yeah. Okay, so you were a teenager. Yeah. Uh, what do you think he would have said in a sentence uh, if he watched your Matilda? He would have said, oh, it's nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> He's a pretty grumpy dude and he hated guys with beards. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, okay, your, another question coming in. Uh, you're bringing back your show back uh, yeah. back to Australia. What can we expect from this show? What, what oh, same as last time. I mean, it's very much an encore of what I did earlier this year. And it's called Old Songs, New Songs, Fuck You Songs because I hadn't toured for so long and I just wanted to – sort of do new versions of old stuff and there's there's new stuff i'm putting out an album th this next year and um there's a bit of stuff from that i i haven't really written comedy songs since 2011 and i don't think mm. i'm it's never been you know i really was only a comedian for five years and i'm hashtag blessed what a five years though yeah <laughs> big five years yeah. i mean it it got there and then i concentrated on other stuff and i i'm the tour, I've just got back from the UK yesterday. The tour has just been such a joy and so great to be back on stage and go, oh, this is actually what I'm good at. This thing where I just talk to people and play piano. I, I sort of forgot, you know. Mm. And I think because it happened so quickly and suddenly I was playing arenas and stuff, I sort of just went, oh, people like that. Good. Okay, I've done that. Move on. And now with a few years space and being back on stage, I think I respect how lucky I am and what an amazing thing it is to have an audience who are willing to come and watch you rabbit on and put too many rhymes in oh, short fantastic. space time um okay so we've still got a few more to get through uh love your role on californication someone has written uh as the washed up frequently nude rocker atticus what was the what was fun uh to play uh and did, did it come naturally yeah uh, i mean i thought they had written the role for me but they'd never <laughs> they'd never heard of me i just went and auditioned and i still had my makeup on from the last night and i was Thank dressed you. like i dressed and they were like hey what's your name and i'm like to mention they're like i did the scene once and they went great do you want to do it again and i went no i think that's it 
And they went, okay. And I walked out and I, I'm driving down the road in a hired Mustang. And it's just one of those LA stories. My agent rings and goes, what did you do? And I'm like, oh, I was just put on a slight English accent and acted like I was on drugs. And he went, he went, they want you back for a wardrobe fitting. And that, wow. I, I, he was in for two episodes and they wrote the whole thing. So I stayed in the whole season. Cool. Mm. Um, he mean, was so much fun. It did look fun. And it also... Yeah. It, I it love being naked. It, it put, <laughs> I mean, like you were, you're amongst such talent. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Marilyn Manson was on that show. Yeah, I mean, that's a version uh, of talent, yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> why do you have thoughts about Marilyn Manson? No, no. it was pretty <laughs> hilarious having him on the show. I mean, yeah. he, he's a very talented musician. He's an interesting actor. But yeah, no, he's, he's great. And Duchovny was great. And I, I've become lifelong friends with Natasha McAlone, the world's most beautiful, intelligent woman. And... Um, yeah, mm. just gorgeous and the, and the DOP and the whole, you know, sometimes in America you walk into a show like that and it's especially in season six it can have gone a bit poisonous and everyone's just gritting their teeth but this mm. was a beautiful community of yeah. people, yeah. You make me really want to pull on that thread, that Marilyn Manson thread. Oh, uh, right, yeah. I don't, you I, wash on it but I, we'll go somewhere I, else. I saw him in a pub in Sydney a few years ago yeah. off his, you know, he – he needs allegedly. To, he, he he needs to look after himself a bit better. But um, he's an incredible. What he did, I mean that before he was like the last music billionaire before digital started fucking with everyone. He, Damn Napster. Yeah, yeah totally. Damn Napster. you. Yeah. Um, a lot of questions coming in about Millie Alcock. Um, of course, Alcock. Alcock. Mm -hmm. Uh, your co-star in Upright. Yeah. She, I mean, from the moment she hits the screen, she yeah. is sensational. She yeah. is this pugnacious, fiery wildcat who is so annoying yet you love her. Yeah. Um, what was she like? What was... Uh, I, 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 I love her. I mean, I, I can't... It's hard to do a short answer about Millie, but we, we did write an impossible role. We, we wrote a role for a 16-year-old, you know, if you believe her, kid who had to be funny and gutsy and and sweary and be able to completely undo herself and be vulnerable. And, I mean, we, I sort of went, what have we done? We're not going to be able to find this kid. Mm. And then we found her. I thought, I think she can do it. And then she, 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 she's so much better than we realised even after giving her the role. Mm. And she's an awesome human. And she was not even 19. She, she plays very young, but she was, she was 18 and a half. She, she quit year 12 to do this show and she was on set for 10 weeks. She never had a minder. Her mum never came to visit. Her mum's like a single mum and she's a nanny, can't afford to take time off work. I'm like, well, fly her in. She's like, no, she's got to look after her kids, you know. So she, she was the character. She, she, <laughs> she, she you know, she's had an interesting life. It's not mine to tell. She'll, she'll tell you herself, but, um, but she is so mature, she, in a way, and we, I just left her alone because I'm literally sitting in a ute with an 18-year-old girl hour, who I didn't know very well hour after hour and I'm like, okay, my job is to let her set all the boundaries of our relationship. I didn't, you know, there's no high fives or hugs or anything. I'm just like, well, I'll just let her come to me and uh, ask me questions. I kind of co-directed some of it and, and, and just – as the characters got closer and closer, Mill and I got close. I mean, I, I, I love her. I mean, mm. I, I, we talk and we were together last night at the actors and she's an incredible girl. And now because she's so good in this, I can see where this could go. And now I just want to like stop her going to LA too soon. And I want to know who she's meeting with. Cause I know all those cunts, you know, um, <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah. I'd like to congratulate you. You're the first person to drop the C-bomb yeah. on Bill. Thank you very uh, much. Can we get him an award? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please. yeah. Um, I'll ask one last Q&A, uh, and that is, when you come back to Australia, what do you think about our government and the lack of priority for our environment and climate change? A pretty heavy question <laughs> for a Q&A, but please, uh, your thoughts. <laughs> I think if any leader on the planet is not basically making uh, carbon the center of their platform you're just a a, a fool I, but I, I i don't think i have a huge problem with how uh, i talk about a lot in my live show with how divisive we're being by how tribal we're being by all the false dichotomies i have intelligent progressive friends who constantly are just shouting like posting what israel falau said like just we we need to stop being 
assuming evil intent in anyone we disagree with. We, we, it is human to assume nefarious intent in people we disagree with and the internet just magnifies that massively. I don't think Scott Morrison's a bad person. Mm. I think he's been miseducated. I think uh, church is bad for your brain. I think especially his church, it's just if every hour he had spent in that church, he'd instead spent reading real books about real stuff, he would be a much, much better man. Turn to science. Yeah. He, he needs to he, – he, 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 you're allowed to believe what you want, but if you're going to be the prime minister of a largely secular country, I, I want to know exactly what he fucking believes. Mm. I, I, I don't think – him saying that's my private life is good enough. If you think Jesus was magic, how are you going to interpret climate da data? Mm. I mean, you can't, you can't, you're allowed to believe Jesus is magic, but don't come to me about climate data. Yeah. You're, you're playing in a different fucking sandpit, bro. <laughs> uh, it's, it's terrible. Yeah. And that the, the right, you know, so I, I'm nervous, but I, I, I don't, you've got to be careful. Cause if we keep screaming that Scott Morrison's evil, the next thing that happens is you get a Donald Trump. Yeah. And then he'll be like, oh, I wish we had. To. I mean, literally, you wish you had Howard back. Uh, that motherfucker. <laughs> you know, you, I, mean, I do. I wish we had Howard back. So, so we've got to be careful about how, yeah. uh, how much we, we assume everyone who doesn't think what we think is evil. But yeah, Australia should be a world leader in, mm. in, in we are rich beyond our wildest dreams through no fault of our own because we dig up primary resources out of land that isn't ours. We should be humble and be trying to be a world leader leveraging our wealth into 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 renewable tech that, that I, i'd be so proud mm. but i'm hearing what you're saying and i i 100 agree with you but we're going into that time of the year where oh god i'm going to be surrounded by people that disagree with me and they don't believe in just shout climate them. change it works if we, if we can't yeah. shout no wait, wait what can we do i i it's it's christmas we're going to be hanging out with family who think that it's all a myth I mean, what do we even say? This is a genuine question from my own. I sort of <laughs> feel we, like. What do I say? I mean, I can Hi, be Mom. quite smug and passive aggressive, as you can imagine. But I mean, my pet, my dad, because he reads the West Australian, he's a highly intelligent, very scientifically literate Doctor. surgeon. Yeah. yeah. But he was like, mm, and he, he needs data. He's like, I'm not convinced. And I went, <laughs> well, what, what P value do you want? Like, you, you should be. And, and he is now, um, but th there's absolutely no doubt whatsoever that the broad stroke hypothesis of anthropogenic climate change is true and becoming truer and, if anything, mm. uh, underestimated the impact. There's, it's it's a, a fact. Mm. And, and I think what you just have to say is um, I totally get that whatever you're reading makes it not look like a fact, but it, it's actually a fact. And we can argue about it, but um, it's not up to us to argue about it. You just ask the scientists and they'll mm. tell you it's a fact. Mm. I, I know Brian Cox personally and Richard Dawkins and geneticists and I, 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 these are, I've never met a scientist, whether they're a celebrity scientist or a person working in a lab at a university. I've not met one who doesn't go, yeah, it's, it's, just, there. it's just there in the data. Like, there's not, they're not there. There's virtually none. Mm -hmm. So why would you go, that scientist says it's a myth? Well, if you believe scientists, what, what, from what? Here's a question. If you are pointing to any scientist saying it's not true, then you, <laughs> then you are respecting the authority of scientists. What about you makes you choose the minority? Mm. Okay. I mean, and your mum will go, why are you ruining Christmas? <laughs> and you'll say, you'll say, because you're not my real mother. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I mean, let's step away into something a little bit nicer. Let's talk about Christmas. I uh, like Christmas. I know you like Christmas. Yeah. Uh, funnily enough, uh, you remind me of Christmas. Ah. Uh, and I, and you mean I'm sweaty and full <laughs> of prawns? Full of glee. Uh, there is one song that my housemate plays uh, on the piano for me every time I spend time with him over Christmas, and that is you know, drinking wine in the sun. You know, uh, white wine in the sun is the Australian Christmas carol, uh, yet so much deeper than Jingle Bells. It's like, you know, Jingle Bells is an allegory, man. Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's metaphorical. Yeah, it's totally um, the bells are. Yeah, I wanted to get your thoughts on on Christmas. Are you still fond of Christmas? Is, is yeah, Christmas yeah. a good time for Tim? It is. 
And uh, I've, I've just started playing White Wine. So I was in the UK touring and just the last week of the tour, I started, I dropped White Wine into the um, encore. And it's interesting, the Poms love that song, even though it seems weird to them. But the um, I, I wrote that song two weeks after my daughter was born. So, um, you know, this weekend, 13 years ago, mm. and I missed Violet's 13th birthday, which was last weekend, because um, I was away and I'd been away for two months. So I was playing that song. I played it on her birthday and I got one of my bandmates to hold the phone up, the mm. FaceTime up so she could see me playing it in front of like 3,000 people. Because of course it's a song about uh, yeah, to, your, it, to your daughter. It, it, it starts as a song about – the interesting thing about the song is it starts as a song about how I'm cynical about Christmas because I'm not religious and all that. And then it becomes about family and everyone goes, oh, it's actually about family despite the fact that he's not into Jesus and stuff. And you think you know – the the emotional borders of the song and then it goes you my baby girl and it goes and everyone goes oh it's about a baby and they start getting teary and i can't get through i find it hard to get through having missed fire's birthday and mm. i it, it, it's still it's still the song in my entire the piece of work in my entire life that i found emotionally most difficult to write mm. like sobbing mess in my attic in london 13 years ago and still resonates for me when you've played songs hundreds of times you it's an acting job telling the truth uh with that song it always mm. it, it always works i'm i'm proud of that song it's good yeah. it's too long and it's like my answers <laughs> I, I would even say it's and my it, penis it, it, <laughs> I'd say that uh, you you had to spoil that really beautiful moment we just had there. I think I deliberately really spoiled it because I, I said proud. Mm. And it, when you brought up like me, if you say you're proud, you have to then make yourself feel like a fool. Okay. Mm. You're like a clown. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Sincerity <laughs> um, is poison. Okay. Well, I, I only have one last question for you. Uh, and that is, Tim, what do you want for Christmas? Um... Um, I, 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 I've got my English friends coming, uh, to stay with us in Perth. I just want, uh, I want there to be no flies on Northcott beach on Christmas morning. I want to take my palms down there with a Santa hat and my bathers on and I need it to be what it usually is, which is fucking perfect. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll see what we can do. Thank uh, you very much. But, uh, Tim Minchin, thank you so much for joining us Pleasure. here. Pleasure. Thank you, Danny. Build. Please make sure you experience Upright. This has been Tim Minchin on Build Series Sydney.